right, I'm finally back, but not for long. Uh, Wendell, it looks like we're moving operations to the Seattle area. And I think uh, the, Can't the say nerds I'm surprised. will all... Uh, yeah, it's, it seems to be a good spot for nerds, you know, out there. So uh, if you guys are in the Seattle area, maybe we'll be seeing you in, in the uh, local hacker spaces. Uh, maybe over at Mox, I've been hanging out there with Timmy Tech and some of the other guys. Maybe we'll be hanging out with, uh, who knows, Barnacles. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of insanity going on out there. Um, you're going to be coming out quite a bit, Wendell, you think? Maybe? Maybe. It seems like it. I kind of like that area. Yeah, that'd be good. I've Maybe got stuff nice. to do there. <laughs> <laughs> and if and if there isn't actually any stuff to do, you'll go out there and make some stuff to do, right? <laughs> There's always stuff to do. <laughs> All right, let's uh, the shirt of the month. It is a new month, and we have a new shirt. And uh, the Linux community has uh, really been picking up. And uh, you know, we've been trying out Linux a lot and doing a lot of Linux videos. So we decided it was time to get some Linux, uh, you know, stuff. So you guys can, um, I don't know, <laughs> you guys like Linux, we like Linux, it's good. So this is our uh, new Linux Penguin, and uh, this is going to be a rare limited edition shirt. We're going to do it this month, and that's all you're going to get, um, because this is going to be, we, we, we have a an official Linux logo that we're going to unveil very soon. Uh, this is the introduction. It's not the official logo, it's special for this month only. And uh, then we'll uh, be unveiling the official one very soon. So let me show you what we do have. We have the cotton, and we also have the uh, tri-blend, which are slightly softer and more athletic. So pick the one you like. It also, the, you know, the, the prints on the, the tri-blend have a more distressed look, as you can see there. And, uh, of course, we've got the Burning Earth lapel pin. He's very serious, you know. He's got his suit and tie on, orange tie. It's, I, I, I quite enjoy this. And also, thanks to uh, Whiskey Ranger, he put together the artwork for this. Um, and he's done a hell of a job with uh, most of the artwork on our site. So, yeah. All right, let's uh, get down to business here. I always push the wrong button. There it is. <laughs> if you like what There's... we're doing on the Linux channel, which is youtube.com slash techlinux, please buy a t-shirt. Yeah, it, it's, it would help us <laughs> very much. Like, That's like the best way to help us uh, keep make, to keep making con content. That was a terrible sentence, but you, you get the idea. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's check out this new app called Crystal. Now, Crystal is an app that self-proclaimed here. It's going to be the biggest thing for email since spell check. Now, what Crystal does is it looks at, you know, everyone in your, uh, your friends list or whatever, and it analyzes their social behavior. And then it tells you how to speak to them in conversation, how to write to them in emails. And it's supposed to help you to, if, if you're trying to find ways to sway certain people to do things or ways to convince people of things, it will tell you the best methods for each individual. So for instance, for instance here, this is just a, you know, it created a profile for Alexis here. And this is, this is all hypothetical. Maybe this is real. I don't know. But anyway, it went through and looked at all the social posts and it actually looks at stuff from Google and everything. It just looks up everything and then gives you pointers and says, you know, like when speaking, switch up the subject to, to keep things interesting. So she has a short attention span, use colorful descriptions. So this does not sound like a friend of mine. <laughs> And then when emailing her, appeal to her feelings to drive her to action. Yeah, this is uh, not someone I would I would enjoy dealing with. And I would probably not have a very successful uh, conversation with this person through email because I'm very to the point, very, here are the facts, here's the thing. I don't care about emotions. Let's just get this stuff done. I don't care about your feelings. This is what happens and this is how it happens and you should do it because of this. And I'm very just blunt. So with this app, it may, you know, there may be a different method. I guess the, the bigger question is here is, is this invasive? Is this too much information? Is this um, something that, uh, do, do we need to be able to analyze each other socially and then use that information to manipulate other people? Will this change the way that we correspond with one another um, so that we're always, you know, pretending to be nice and appealing to whatever they like just so that um, we can get things out of them. Is it going to, I mean, that, that's kind of what we do with email anyway. I feel like it's almost, <laughs> I kind of want it. I don't know. What do you think, Wendell? Uh, so this program is kind of sociopathic. Like if you were a psychologist and you were looking at this program and you were sort of doing this process internally in your own head, the psychologist would probably say that you're sociopathic. Just throwing that out there. Uh, but, you know, sociopaths do make really good CEOs, and they get stuff <laughs> done. So for business well, relationships, I mean, would this be, would this be, I mean, I'm sure it would be useful. But uh, I'm, sure, the, the I'm sure concerns. that it would be useful. 
well, let's just let's just put it this way. If there are any venture capitalists in the audience, um, I've already got a program that will just seed tons of misinformation on social profiles and Twitter and things like that if you need a layer <laughs> of subterfuge. So good luck with your algorithms mining, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> So that's all I need. I need people that are trying to appeal to my soft side. And then they're going to talk about puppies and stuff because we've sent out so much misinformation that that's linked to my name. That's what we need to do. It's just going to confuse awful. the bejesus out of algorithms like this. But yeah, no, <laughs> totally. And it's not that this program is going to be like, you know, you're not thinking about this in terms of uh, like the application presents it as like, you know, two friends talking to one another. It's like, how can we get together and ball? No, that's totally not what's going to happen. This is going to be used by Comcast and Visa and MasterCard and mega corporations like that. Oh, when you call shit. in. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what's going to happen. Oh, so God, like, no. <laughs> so you've got the, the, the CSR in India and the computer is like telling them to do whatever. They're, they're already, I mean, it's already completely insane. Don't forget that we also have the English speaking soundboard option. And so this is really amazing. Have you guys seen this? It's like uh, uh, a couple of years ago they were accusing... Uh, these robo dialers of being uh, AI, basically, because somebody recorded the conversation and the responses weren't exactly the same. It wasn't somebody saying the same words. It was like it was a recording of exactly the right. same word because it was it was exactly the same every time. And so it turns out that that was a piece of software. And so what would happen is somebody would call into a call center and there would be a human operator that can't really speak English very well but can understand it. Um, and every possible response to the person calling in was on a soundboard. And so the, the person in a foreign country that could not speak English really well would listen to the question and then they would hit the button on the soundboard that corresponds to uh, the response that the caller was looking for. And so it, when the when the caller started asking all kinds of insane questions, it was like, oh, no, I can't help you with that. And then blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, no, I can't help you with that. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, no, I can't help you. And it's it's... And so it's like, was this AI? Was I talking to Siri? It's like, no, you were talking to a human being through a soundboard. This is the next evolution of that. This is uh, marketing 2.0, if you will. You know, um, well, that, that soundboard thing, back to that. Did you, did you ever hear the recording where the people were asking them direct questions like, hey, are you a computer? And it would be like a four-second pause and be like, <laughs> that's silly. Of course not. But they yeah, were exactly. the computers. It was really disturbing. So anyway, yeah. I don't... I, I, I don't know. Probably I get, on page I guess, two of the clickable sounds. Yeah, they'd like, <laughs> oh no, to get there. they're on to us. <laughs> get to page two. They should just, if, if they want to do stuff like that, they should just use those Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylve Sylvester, you know, Stallone soundboards. That's much more fun, you know, like, come on, <laughs> shut up, stop it. All that kind of stuff is so much more fun uh, when you're dealing with soundboards. It's so anyway, 2001 all over again. I, I, yeah, I know. But, but what, there was nothing to do before YouTube. Let's make soundboards of old movie clips, and it takes forever, and we've got to use uh, you know, the, the Microsoft recording program to, to, to capture these stupid little clips that we've hooked up from our RCA recorder through our whatever capture card. Anyway, um, this, this program is called Crystal, right? I think we should make uh, you know, the app, the subterfuge version of this app called Crystal Method. What do you think? <laughs> let's get it let's get it cooking shall we uh, no oh, i'm sure God. there's some other hilarious street drug name someone's going to po post in the comments that's like not it's not crystal meth it's uh or crystal method it's uh something else i'm sure we can come up with something hilarious but yeah yeah subterfuge algorithms for the win because they're gonna do it so you might as well just spray them with as much misinformation as possible all right, funniest uh, street names for drugs in the comments. I want to know. Uh, I need to know these things because I don't really know them. In, uh, you know, I want. I want to know the obscure ones. I mean, like booger sugar and all that stuff. That's like common. <laughs> I mean, you you talk about that down down at the bakery, don't you? So we want to know <laughs> the, the obscure the, ones, the really talk obscure. Talk amongst ones. yourselves. We'll give you a topic. The topic is, <laughs> <laughs> the topic is dot com company name or street drug. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Web 2.0 company name. That's what it should be. <laughs> or yeah. or really, everything Web 2.0 is so bubbly and cute. But some of the, I mean, booger sugar is kind of bubbly and cute, I guess, if you're into sugar and boogers. <laughs> uh, well, we haven't even gotten through the first uh, thing yet. And um, I already I'll just want share, to cancel I'll, I'll go the whole ahead, website. I'll go ahead and share my favorite my my favorite one that I, that I heard somewhere. It was used as a as a derogatory person as a derogatory uh, description of somebody, and it was. Well, I'll share with you the sentence, and that was uh, uh, <laughs> that guy's really messed up. You should not talk to him. He does too much nose candy. Nose candy, yeah, yeah. that's a that's a no. That's a good I've one. never heard that before. 
<laughs> All right. Let's. Uh, I don't even know why I brought this article up. There was a competition to design a um, a giant skyscraper, I guess, or just you know the future of what things are going to look like in 3015. And uh, so some some team put together a concept for this ginormous skyscraper that essentially is Times Square. There's it with the rest of the city in the background, and a thousand years in the future. I don't even know how we can think that far ahead. But the thing that really makes this a complete joke is the fact that there is a Best Buy. In 3015, <laughs> there is still a Best Buy. It looks like there's a Target, too, but yeah. No, 3015, I doubt- there being a Best Buy would be like there's still being a cola company today called Dr. Schwetz. <laughs> you know what? I think that if... I don't know. It, Walmart might not even be around in a thousand years, and Walmart is one of the biggest and most successful companies in the world. But in a thousand years, so many things are going to change that Walmart, if if it's around, it's going to be the world government. But if it's not around, it's just that's, that's just it. I don't know. I I don't think there's any middle ground for it. It's either going to be the world government, and it's going to they're, they're going to frack everything, and then then they're going to build Walmart cities, you know, up above the rest of the burning swill that they've created on the ground. Um, and, and we're going to live above this and we're going to use the burning remains of the earth that we created, the, the destruction, you know, the destroyed earth that we created as our uh, heat source and power source. And uh, yeah, I think that's There's what's probably one company that will still be around and that's Lloyd's of London. And I'm sure that we could probably spend five dollars with Lloyd's of London and they would, you know, give us the odds on that. So if Lloyd's of London is still around in a thousand years, that'd be quite a payout. All right, now I want to know in the comments what companies do you guys think will be around in a thousand years? And we'll just go ahead and skip this whole farcical nonsense here because I don't think that our, our places are going to look anything like this. I think that we are going to have organic buildings in a thousand years, like buildings that can heal themselves and, and morph and change. And I don't, I don't think that, I don't, I don't think people are thinking too much in terms of what they know. And, you, you know, if, if a thousand years ago they said, hey, what's the future going to be like? Well, they wouldn't have any idea. They'd be like, oh, they're going to be building uh, stone structures and riding uh, uh, elephants made out of jam. I don't know. But they wouldn't know. They would have no idea. How, how the hell are we supposed to know what's going on? I mean, I guess we no, we, we don't know. We don't know. And Madison once Cube this, Garden. <laughs> there'll be a dodecahedron by then. Um, <laughs> moving right along. Let's take a look at this. Facebook thing that we talked about last week. So the EU is going to be hearing the case from Maximilian uh, Schrems, I believe is his last name. So he's a European law student. We, we talked about this briefly last week, but uh, he's living in Ireland and uh, Facebook has their headquarters in Dublin. And a lot of people in the EU, including the, well, the EU did tell everyone there like, hey, don't use Facebook if you want to make sure that, you know, the USA <clears throat> can't, is not looking at your, your private information. Well, he was like, well, the USA shouldn't be allowed to look at our private information, and he went to court in Dublin. And it was funny, the judge's response in Dublin, you know, in Dublin was like, you know, he, they, they mentioned the Snowden leaks and all this stuff, and he started his case before the Snowden leaks. He just, he was already upset about, you know, the compromise uh, of his own personal security and privacy and all that sort of thing. So when they went to court in Dublin, uh, the guy was like, no, the judge basically said that if anyone, uh, even before you know, Snowden. He said if anyone uh, thought that the government wasn't looking at all their stuff, that they were basically naive. He said that, and um, the big problem here is there's a, there's a rule over there called safe harbor, and that means that USA is a safe harbor, uh, and then that they can be trusted with information. So he's arguing that the USA should not be uh, safe harbor. And the judge, at the end, even though the judge kind of said, you know, there's nothing you can do about it right now, the judge did uh, forward this case on to the EU, and um, he specifically asked the EU to rule on just the just the point of is the U.S. basically a safe harbor anymore? Uh, can we be can we trust them? And if you know a company is required to right now, it's just like hey, here's your information. Let's just go ahead and send it on over to the USA because that's a safe harbor and that's the way it works. And if the USA wants anything, so the EU is going to sit down and they're you know it's all going to go to court and they're going to talk about whether or not the USA still qualifies as a safe harbor and whether or not. You know the information from the from Europe can be just shared almost anonymously. I mean, not 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 anonymously, but without telling you. That's the wrong word, but you guys get the idea. So um, it'll be in- interesting to see what comes out of this. Uh, case is set to be begin pretty soon in Luxembourg, and um, I'm this sure is we'll a keep tabs on this. Not the government, so that's the difference. Right, right. We're gonna take a take a, like a third party look at it. Anyway, <clears throat> I don't know anything else you want to add to that. Basically, no, it's an just, update. It's, 
<clears throat> we all knew that Facebook plays shenanigans with privacy, but the real implications here are probably going to be for Google because I think Google sort of does an end run around this a little bit in the EU as well. And um, <laughs> this is going to be a really interesting case to watch because uh, Facebook is going to spend a lot of money, I think, to try to get a favorable outcome for themselves here. And it may be difficult the way that this guy's structuring the case. All right, let's take a look at uh, Elo. That's the, um, <clears throat> that's, I, I guess it's from Colorado and, and Vermont. There's a bunch of people putting together the anti-Facebook. It came out, everyone signed up, a gazillion people signed up, then it kind of like went out of the headlines and became a joke, and and um, they're still working on it. It was in beta, and you had to be invited and all that sort of thing. Anyway, they just got uh, another round of funding, $5 million, and with this, they've uh, you know made the team a little bit bigger. I think the total funding now is $11 million, and right now what they want to do is uh, you know redesign everything. So... They already had the you know, they already had everything in place, but now they're just redesigning everything. So I will admit that I looked at it in the beta, and I was like, well, it's kind of basic or whatever. It does its thing, and I guess the big draw here is that uh, there's no ads, and they don't harvest any of your data. The way that they make money is by allowing you to uh, buy things, almost like in-app purchases when you're on the Android store or the iOS store or whatever. We're used to that sort of thing when it comes to, to games or something. It's like, oh, you want a new skin for your character? That's fine. Well, the website's like, oh, you want to you know, redo the CSS and change from the light theme to the dark theme? Well, it's a one-time purchase of a couple of dollars, and then you can change the CSS. Hey, there's somebody who's late for an idiot meeting. Is it the deal train? No, it's, a, it's, the, it's some guy in a some guy in a hot rod playing a fool. Yeah. Anyway, one of the last so, rides of the deal train. Yep. Let's see. I don't know if we have any <laughs> deals right now. There's a few deals on the website. I don't want to bring up the deals right now. I was in the middle of. Okay, where, where are the deals? I'm bringing up the deals. Damn it. Here we go. Deals. <laughs> Dead or alive. The deal hooligan. It was the deal hooligan. <laughs> the, deal. <laughs> the, the deal hooligan strikes when you least expect it so just go to uh, techsyndicate.com slash um game deals and you'll see all the game deals there's actually some hardware deals on here that are pretty you know i can't even go on here because i'm like ooh, i could use some of these things and end up buying our own deals so yeah deals are good tell us principal i just got that one that was on sale the other day anyway back to the uh, regularly scheduled program where were we over here doing with stuff with uh, LO, LO Venture Capital. Yeah, Keep an eye so on it. it might be a thing we don't know. Yeah, that's what I want to know from you guys. Is it? Do you guys care about LO? Is it? Do you, do you want a social network that does not harvest your social your your identity? Are you okay with freemium content? And um, are you guys going to sign up for it? I'm just curious out there. A lot, a lot of questions for you guys to talk about in the comments, but there's a lot you know that we that we need to know about these days I, all right so um, i thought it would be a lot of fun like not not this take on it but if there's anybody out there that's bored and has a lot of time to spend on something imagine another version of this where like the creepy thing is that somebody is able to you know gather a lot of inf information and intelligence on you without really sort of letting you know and so that's that's sort of the unsettling thing and so eventually when ai gets to the point that it's useful you could possibly have a digital assistant that is basically yourself but before then, uh, you guys see uh, Burger King's ad campaign, the subservient chicken, where you could type things in to have a chicken do whatever, and it was just a vast library of everything that you could possibly think of, and it would play something. Imagine a version of that where it's you, and you create an entity that is your own personal virtual avatar thingy. And so when somebody's, like, digging on you or digging for information about you, you pop, you know, your virtual avatar is there, and it's like, you know, hello, tell me about you. You know, why are you digging? What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and then that thing can, you know, interact with them so that you don't have to. That would be pretty neat, I think. I think that would also sell really well. Um, funeral homes would probably buy the crap out of that. So it's like as part of your will planning and your estate planning, it's like, would you like to leave your children a creepy thing that's kind of you that can interact with very them? They creepy, can ask yeah. questions. It's like, you know, if, you're, if your kid asks, you know, it's like, why, what happened to grandpa or whatever, then that's the magic question where it's like, oh, yeah, let me play this movie. And so it's just, it's just a vast database. I mean, we, that doesn't need AI. We could do that now. I think Star Trek explored that a little bit. They had holograms that were not really AI, but it could, it, you know, it's sort of an interactive question answer format. And you could kind of have a conversation. Um, we've had that with text bots forever. And so I think that someday social media might be interacting with those kinds of software agents. Because the software agents can, as you interact with that, the software agent can learn about the person that's doing the interaction. And so you could review a log of that later, and that would be neat. 
Um, you know what? I want to mention one more thing uh, about this article before we move on. Just because it makes me sad, and it's, it's, I guess it's more of a personal thing, but just in the, the top caption here, you know, uh, the, the, the main guy, Paul, he's been handling the vision and the front-facing operations out of Vermont, and then the Colorado team has been working on a full redesign of the site. Guys, I love it here. Uh, one of the main reasons I'm moving out west is because I want access to more of the behind-the-scenes stuff, and it's just impossible to put that together here. There's just the resources. Man, it makes me so sad. So small, but it's here. I mean, he. I imagine they would have staffed everything out of Vermont if they could. But you know, you need a big team. You need access to lots of different people. Um, and sometimes, I mean, there 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 can be stuff happen. You know, that happens up here. But um, you know, there's just such a deeper well in different parts of the country. It makes me sad because the internet infrastructure and the government in New England is really nice. Well, Maine's kind of weird right now, but in Mass and Vermont, th- those places are pretty uh, groovy. Anyway, just uh, if you guys, I don't know, live in those places and, and, and feel the pain, know that I felt it too. All right. This is a pretty cool little website that someone put together called ComcastCustomerHelp.com. Uh, and it's essentially Comcast Customer Service. It's saying that, you know, these, it's, it's, they, they list several different representatives. And then they, they show how much they have received from Comcast. And they're calling these guys Comcast Customer Service. And that's pretty much what they are. Um, and then they've given you numbers uh, and links to contact them. So by all means, go ahead and contact them. There's even some handy dandy questions here that you can ask them, especially if they're in your district, you know. So and it tells you where where they're at, you know. That's pretty uh pretty fun. The there. creepy thing about all the pictures of the people here where that are the receiving the top contributions from uh uh Comcast is that almost none of them are smiling with their eyes. It's just so it's the, they're the, dead. The, Look at their dead all, hollow eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the uncanny valley of happiness. <laughs> oh, God. But they've got a nice big house and a yacht. I love my yacht. Hold on a second. Let's freaking Marsha Blackburn here. Let me just get this. Yeah. Oh, I love my yacht. Hmm. I don't know if she has a yacht or not. She's in, she, she's in Tennessee. I really enjoy my little cabin in Gatlinburg. It's nice. It's really close to Dollywood. Mm. All that Comcast money. Uh, you know what, Chattanooga? Y'all better stop it, or I'm gonna. We're gonna have to nuke your little fiber oh, operation. <laughs> Listen, everybody. I'm Marsha Blackburn. I'm sorry, that's enough of that. <laughs> I got a little carried away there and forgot that we were recording. So let's just move on and talk about Canada. How about that, Canada? Yeah, let's get screw screw the USA. They're, they don't know what they're talking about. Let's go to Canada where they really don't know what they're talking about. All right, Canada. There's a new bill called C51, and it's more concerning than uh, than CISA. Is that how you say CISA? Uh, it's more more concerning than that according to some of the people who know what they're talking about. Actually, some of the guys from Mozilla wrote a blog. And here's the bottom line with this one. Everything's, even with the Patriot Act, things are compartmentalized, you know, where people have, people have medical records and dental records. Well, those are both kind of going the same thing. They have medical records and then they have debt records and then they have, you know, like uh, web records and they, you have different compartments filled with your different records. And it's not just a free for all, even with the Patriot Act. If someone does something wrong, you can go look at their their past in one of those areas. Whereas the bill that's being uh, you know introduced in Canada pretty much just removes all barriers and all compartments, so that all the information, if someone wants to know something about you, well, they can look up everything from, like I said, your medical past to your uh, you know your your history as far as driving records. Just they can look up anything they want. Your phone records, it's all available to them. And you know what, but it's okay because it's gonna stop terrorism in Canada because terrorism is such a, a, a terrible problem in Canada. It's, I mean, it's like every day I turn on my television and I'm seeing another terrorist attack in Canada and some other terrorists have built, uh, you know, an underground uh, information center in Canada. That we know that there's it's just pr- pretty much the terrorist population is about 80% of the population in Canada now. So they need this in place. So it's okay, right? Is that, that about, about right, Wendell, you think? Yeah. <laughs> about 80%. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah. I, I, feel, I feel your pain up there, guys in Canada. I don't know. Anything else you want to add to this nonsense? It's, I think that's pretty much it. But uh, this, this kind of thing is... Uh, is uh, 
trying this in other countries and especially Australia is sort of trying the waters before they do this kind of thing in America. And so it's like somebody, they want somebody to take the plunge on this so that then the other, the, the, the powers that be in the other countries can point to that country and say, we got to get with the program. We got to get with the times, you know, you know, Canada of all places has this legislation and we need it here too. And uh, so you sort of have to be vigilant everywhere because you know, pretty soon it's going to be, well, St. Kitts and Nevis has this C-51 thing, and we really need to pass that in America because, you know, St. Kitts and Nevis, is they've got it. So, we, and you know, that's like not even America. We need it in America and Canada and Australia and everywhere. I mean, that's what they're going to be relegated to. <laughs> why, would, why would St. Kitts and Nevis have anything? They're just like anything goes there. It's like, oh, yeah, whatever, whatever it's fine. <laughs> Like, I don't, do they even have laws there? I don't know. They should move there. Just for, you can run around and shoot people all while naked and riding a horse. You can do whatever you want there. It's crazy. It's like the We're Wild West. We're going to Nevis to join NAFTA just so we can say, <laughs> look, they have it. You know, they're really progressive in, in, in this kind of thing. We need to be on board with this. It's just, it's just manipulation is all it is. Yeah, and then... Can wait for the sequel, Nevis and Butthead. Uh, anyway, let's take a look at uh, Verizon, what they're doing here. Uh, well, you know what? Let's just talk a minute about what I said was going to be the big problem with the FCC's reclass reclassification uh, under Title II. I said that their language regarding data bandwidth caps was kind of muddy, and it was like a oh, case-by-case basis sort of thing, and we don't know, and uh, let's let's write 15 pages of back-and-forth nonsense, him-ha legal speech, and not actually say anything. So, of course, we're going to have lots of different companies who are going to try to abuse this as much as possible. And it may actually be against the spirit of net neutrality in the first place. So here, here we have Verizon, and there's a large truck outside making tons of noise. But I'm going to keep going. Sorry about the truck, guys. It's prime prime truck time around here. So anyway, um, they are coming up with their own streaming uh, service. And it looks like they're streaming. You know, this is not set in stone yet, but it looks like their streaming service is going to be exempt to their very tiny data caps uh, on mobile, right? So there's that, and that's going to be discriminatory because it's going to give their service an edge over all the others. But that's probably what they're going to do because they're Verizon, and they are the loudest baby that you know laying in the floor, kicking and screaming. That's them. If you hear if you hear one that's like really pounding the floor, screaming and snotting all over the place, that's Verizon. And the one that's just like you know eating the paint chips, well that's AT and T. And then the one that's like stealing everyone else's toys, that's Comcast. So that, that's just, <laughs> that's just how, you, how you have to figure all that out. So anyway, a judge has rejected AT&T's claim that the FT, FTC can't stop unlimited data throttling. So this is not an exact case here, but this does show that the FTC can have some pull or can actually, you know, dictate a few things when it comes to data throttling because AT&T was selling an unlimited service and then they were putting a cap on it. So not the same thing there, but this is all the whole data bandwidth caps thing that I said was going to be a huge you know, murky gray issue, and it was going to cause lots of problems. And then, I mean, for me this week, I've been looking at homes, you know, and places to, to move out in the Seattle area. And, you know, a lot of the places have fiber from, uh, there's condo uh, fiber, and there's uh, a few others that are local that are awesome. I forgot the, the names of the other ones, but there are a few other local fiber companies that are running fiber and have, you know, gigabit for like 80 bucks a month, 60 bucks a month for 100 megabits a second. Uh, and they're you know, all over the place. And I moved into the footprint of one of them and called him up. And I was like, hey, man, I moved into your footprint. Let's get that fiber hooked up. And they're like, ooh, you're, you know, you're there, but no one else in your area has called us asking for fiber. So the, we haven't really done anything yet. We'll run you, we'll, you know, we'll do the last mile thing if more people call. So now when I, as soon as I land, I'm going to go door to door and just scare a lot of people with these things. Like, please, can you, can you call? And we need fiber. And, and people are going to be like, oh, CenturyLink is seven megabits. That's great. So... No, it's not. So CenturyLink and Comcast are the two things. And, you know, CenturyLink is incredibly slow and Comcast is rolling out data bandwidth caps to everyone in their market. And um, this is, I mean, I'm going to call and verify more on this, but the, the last dude that I talked to with Comcast, at first he said there was no data bandwidth caps. And I said, can you like super verify all these things? And he went and talked to supervisors and put me on hold and did all these things and came back and said, oh, you know what? As of March 24th this year, an internal update states that the bandwidth caps will be rolling out to all markets very soon. So yeah, the data bandwidth cap thing is really, I think, almost more important than than some of the other things that had more definite speech, um, because that that can put people out of business. So like that would put us out of business essentially. 
So I'm going to have to try to figure something out. It looks like we're going to be moving to a Comcast neighborhood. I'm going to be petitioning everyone. But, um, yeah. I, I don't know. There, well, there's. Go ahead. I, I mean, even, you know, in America with all the insanity and blah, 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 $250 a month maybe for unlimited would not be completely unreasonable for a commercial connection. But the reality is that uh, in these, it there's... An economist did a study, and when he did a study of this, as the prices change, the demand did not change. And so, the you know, in a capitalistic market, it's like, oh, uh, we can charge whatever we want because we're the incumbent, and there's no competition, and you know, it's whatever price the market will bear. And when that's true, um, the, uh, the the demand supply curves follow sort of this gaussian curve kind of thing i don't know and uh they looked at communication prices from like 96 to 2003 or 2004 and um the communication prices did not follow the curve it it was always going up no matter what the price was even when it was insane and the reason for that is because it's not a discretionary spend anymore it is a necessity it is a public utility this exact thing happened with the electrical grid in the country you had edison and you had um uh, like Edison, New Jersey, and Edison, New York, and all these independent providers all along the eastern coastline that were all fighting with one another, and they were all supplying slightly different electricity, and it was all kinds of weird. And there was so much competition that they put them they put themselves basically out of business because there would be a huge capital expenditure in the equipment, and then they would make all their money back on the service. And so if everybody was competing with everybody else on the cost of electricity, nobody could ever get their equipment paid off, and the electrical grid was uh, held together with bailing wire and duct tape, which is very bad because duct tape had not even been invented yet at the time. And so all this has played out <laughs> with the electric grid. Uh, we, we've already learned a lesson here. And so the, the at least not necessarily internet access, but the infrastructure, the last mile infrastructure, the fiber optic, we have no choice but to make that a public utility. I'm not sure that... You know, like government access to the thing, and like more, go- they're just going to screw it up. But the it is so easy to separate the services from the infrastructure. The same way that the electrical grid, and to a certain, to a lesser extent, the telephone grid, almost sort of, kinda. But water and sewer and those kind of thing, that connectivity is a public utility, and we don't we don't have to we don't really have to debate about it and try to. It's like oh, capitalistic, blah blah blah. No, it's a captive market. You can charge whatever you want and people will pay it. And the, the math and the models show that. And so by doing that, which is exactly what they're doing with this, the CAPS is a way to introduce artificial scarcity. And they're setting it just low enough so that hopefully no one will care. And then by the time everybody is streaming high-definition Netflix, it's going to be, oh, it's service-based. That is going to absolutely destroy our economy. The, the entire rest of the world is going to laugh at us for being so so ridiculously stupid and so greedy as their economies transform into information economies and they are able to do faster, better, cheaper than us and we can't even get delivery of goods. It's like it's like not having federal interstate roads. It's like, oh, we don't need that. We can make that all toll roads. We don't need roads at all because roads are how goods are delivered and nobody needs to receive goods. That doesn't make sense. This is how people receive data and data is the new goods. This is the new federal interstate system. It's just, it's terrible. Now, speaking of receiving data, uh, in Atlanta, Comcast has decided to roll out their um, Gigabit Pro. So they're trying to one-up Google. I mean, Google has expanded uh, Google Fiber. They've got Gigabit, um, and they've already run it all over Atlanta. They're still expanding in that area. But Comcast, I mean, I think they're feeling the pressure um, from, from that. And so they've decided two Gigabit, and they're rolling that out. Um, <laughs> there are a few, there's a few catches here. Number one, it's Comcast. That's a, that's a catch. So number two, um, there's going to be a substantial uh, installation fee. So they didn't say exactly what it was, but it is going to be a substantial installation fee. Um, number Sir, that's up to two gigabit. I can't help yeah. it if you're getting three megabit. <laughs> yeah. Number three, you're probably going to have to use um, Google's equipment. I mean, not Google's, Comcast's equipment. They're, with their higher speed stuff, they're very specific on what equipment you can and cannot use. Uh, and it's extremely difficult to use your own gear. A lot of times they'll block the gear, even if it's compatible. I'm using an uh, you know an incompatible Doxus 3 modem right now, um, and I had to 
call Comcast and read them a series of false numbers for my MAC address. And it worked after I called like the third person because halfway through like one call, they were like, are you using a, the, a sneaky modem? And I was like, hang up, call again. So I finally got <laughs> someone who activated the damn thing and I, it, I, it works, but someone on their end had to activate it and, and make it work. But and say, or you're basically just turn it on and say like, okay, that works. It, it's a, it's a good modem. So yeah, um, I'm, it, they're going to make it very difficult for you to use any other modems, and then their modems can do all kinds of terrible things, and they're also not very good for security purposes. So, I mean, Doxus 3 is not even fast enough for, for gigabit, let alone 2 gigabit. So, um, the, the, the last question I would be, um, you know, I would have about this is, what are the data bandwidth caps going to be? Right now, they're saying that on the, uh, they're like 100 and 150 megabits per second. They're giving you a generous three or 300 uh, gigabytes per month and the guy on the phone told me that dude you can you can you can send like eight million emails and i'm like yeah because that's exactly what i do with my internet these days i send eight million emails no <laughs> <laughs> like that's just absolute nonsense it's, I, why, why would they even quantify things in that way no uh, if someone's getting this the idea here is that the things that you're not doing on the internet are not because you don't want to do them. It's because you're prohibited by your current restrictions and service. So if we had two gigabit, you know, we could be on, on like almost like a, a home network from here to Kentucky to Seattle to wherever. You know, we could we could basically create a virtual office and be sharing files and assets. Maybe we could get together with some other YouTubers and and make some funny videos and share files and assets back and forth, and it would all be like we had our own little NAS box somewhere. The, the possibilities would be way bigger if we had access to that sort of thing, you know. But if they if they set a data bandwidth cap, even if it's like one terabyte, that's going to be complete. That's going to completely for me make the service completely irrelevant. I, I was already used. I already used like two terabytes last month on our on our plan here. So <laughs> yeah, people who are power users, it won't be a thing. So I want to know what their data people bandwidth caps are going to be. Yeah, I mean let's let's be serious about this. It's eight million emails. Or eight streaming Blu-ray movies, or about twelve two-hour-long high-def video conferencing things for work, and, and you're done. <laughs> or we could show, or, or or sharing like two projects back and forth from from here to the office. You know what I mean? Like sharing two projects back and forth is like, oh, well, there's your bandwidth cap. It's done. Sorry. Next time you're gonna have to maybe use some USB three drives and some and then just you know physically mail them there. That that's probably what you should have done in the first place, right? Is that what? The, the, do we still live in like you know 1990? Come on, this is silly. The other, so the other thing ahead. that should fail immediately at the federal level because there is already case law in at least in America that's for this is so for every I think five was it five gigabytes you go over it's another thirty dollars something like that. Um, no, it's, it's, it was something completely outrageous. Um, it was when I talked to them. It was uh, for each uh, fifty gigabit, uh, fifty gigabytes. I'm sorry, for, for each fifty gigabytes, it's ten bucks. So I okay. did the math on mine, and it would have been close to six hundred dollars for my total bill with like you know my current price plus the overage fee plus the taxes and all that crap. It would have been almost six hundred bucks, like five sixty or something like that. So that's what my price would have been last month if the data bandwidth caps had been rolled out in this market, which they are going to be rolled out very soon, so I can expect those great, awesome high prices. Thanks, there was, uh, there was The last time this came up, the, the reason I ask is the situation was such that if you had two modems with two 300 gigabyte caps, that it would cost about 30% less than having one modem that you go over the, the, you go over the cap on, which, of course, is just... It, it's so stupid that I may have an aneurysm. <laughs> You know, um, you know, I even looked into that, getting two regular connections and then banding them together in the modem, and then, Jesus, there's that idiot again. <laughs> I hope he enjoys his little... The old hooligan. Yeah. With his tiny little ding a -ling. Did you hear it? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> can you hear him? Just try to mash that thing on the accelerator? Uh, where was I? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I thought of the whole using two different connections thing and then you know comcast strictly forbids using two connections in the same address uh so i, I would have to go with like century link as my secondary they don't have a data bandwidth cap but they're only like 0.5 on the upload so it's like god i asked the i asked the people on the phone with century like i was like are, are you guys a subsidiary of comcast because every time i call you know and 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 comcast is super fast you guys are super slow 
but you're both available in the same market, so it looks like there's competition. But then I go across the street, and oh my god, CenturyLink has like, you know, 700 megabits or even a gig- gigabit. And Comcast is like, oh, we don't really service this area. We, we get, we'll give you five down. You know, five do you, five down okay? And like, it doesn't make any sense. It's like three three minutes away. I could throw a rock and hit both of these places, but they're they're <laughs> flip-flopped. It's like whenever Comcast is fast, CenturyLink is, is, is slow and vice versa. I, I, it's, the collusion is just off, uh, just out of control there. Anyway, data bandwidth caps are the bane of the internet's existence right now. They're making it very difficult for uh, creators to get things done, and uh, they need to, they need to freaking die, man. It, it's all the money that they're making from us. Instead of them hoarding it and trying to buy other companies, what they should be doing is upgrading their infrastructure, adding more ports, so that we don't have to, you know, deal with data bandwidth caps. There should be enough to go around for everyone. It's not like there's some guy in a mine digging up extra bandwidth. It's not a resource that way. All we need is more ports. You just need to make a bigger pipe, man. You guys have the money to do it, so do it. It's not like right. it's not like the American people didn't subsidize your networks to the tune of four hundred billion dollars in order to upgrade <laughs> it, so that we wouldn't have to have caps. It's not we like that. Oh that, wait, that know? did actually happen. We need that money to buy Time Warner. Shut up! Come on. <laughs> you know, in Mi- Minneapolis knows what's up. Uh, we've mentioned this on several episodes uh, way way back when. But Minneapolis rolled out ten gigabit in the Twin City area of uh, you know St. Paul and and, and uh, Minneapolis. That's crazy. I mean, it's 400 bucks a month, but you can get gigabit for $65 a month. And this is like beautiful, unmetered content. You just, you know, you just do whatever you want with it, man. So, yeah, those guys know what's going on. And, um, you know, no, to date, no silly data bandwidth caps or, or anything. And I imagine that the businesses there are loving it. And I'm, I'm, I'm predicting that in the next few years, if it, the businesses that move there, there's going to be all kinds of stuff cropping up around the area. I would move there in a heartbeat. I love Minneapolis. It's a beautiful place. I just wish it had some mountains. So that was the one piece of the puzzle that it didn't have for me. But yeah. Anyway, let's move on here and look at uh, our good friend Rahm Emanuel. And if you guys do not know who he is, he is the, the the amazingly good mayor of Chicago. And if you guys can detect the sarcasm, then I'll give you a cookie. I don't know. Yeah, this guy is one of the most corrupt mayors in the the country. I don't know how he's still in office, but. Anyway, it, it's looking like Comcast ghost uh, ghost wrote was was a ghost writer for his letters to Congress saying like, "Hey, we really want Comcast to merge with Time Warner in Chicago. That'd be great." And Comcast has been caught ghost writing several other level letters for several other mayors. This would be like the biggest one, and this all happened because of a um, freedom inf- of information request from Mr. Woodman. So he wrote and said, "Hey, I'd like you to get a freedom of information request." He just wanted to know if uh, you know letters, if there are any letters from Comcast with similar uh, vernacular or similar verbiage to the letter that Rahm Emanuel submitted to the government, saying, "Please let Time Warner and Comcast merge." And they wrote back and said, "Yes, we do have lots of incriminating information, but we don't have to give it to you." They they said because um, the Freedom of Information Act does not apply to drafts and versions and partial versions that may be rewritten later so they're like oh you can see it's the final draft but those things exist but you can't have them so they basically admitted to those things being there and the fact that they do not want people to see the comcast letter makes it really seem like he may not have changed much if anything other than sign the damn letter because let's face it he's busy he's got stuff to do he's the mayor of chicago he's got a lot of people to rob i mean come on so it looks like he may have just signed his name off on the Comcast letter and submitted it, and they don't want you to know about that. So they're, you know, saying, oh, you guys can't see it because it's a, it was a pre-decisional correspondence, and you guys aren't allowed to look at that sort of thing under the Freedom of Information, only the final draft. If they would just turn it over, then it would be much, you know, much better off for them because now it just looks like they're trying to cover things up. So, yeah. Totally trying to cover things up because that's how things are operate. I mean... It's it, it and uh, it should be horrifying because it is suitably horrifying. Yeah, all right. I guess we're gonna lighten up just a bit here pretty soon. How about this? A four? I thought this was an April Fool's joke about what's going on in China. A four-day work week in China should be heated, say some of the important people. So they they moved from a six-day to a five-day uh, work week um, several years ago, and it took them several years to realize that that was a key element in making the markets explode there. Uh, Productivity actually went up a little bit, but also the consumers started buying more, started doing more, started investing more back home. Cities started uh, growing a little bit. 
Um, and just, you know, the market started taking a huge uptick. And then, you know, they started looking at some of the Scandinavian countries and also some of the countries in Europe and, uh, you know, like the Netherlands. They've got like a 29-hour work week and they're one of the most productive co countries uh, in Europe. And then Denmark, they've got like a under 40-hour work week and they are the happiest country in the world. So I, I can't see China moving to this anytime soon, but possibly by, by 2030, they will consider moving to a four-day work week. It's been, um, I guess they've been, for the last, they say, a couple of centuries, just grinding and grinding and grinding and grinding. So, I don't know. I think China has, there's a lot of innovation going on in China, a lot of things you don't hear about because the Western world seems to think that they're smarter than China for some reason. Um, maybe it's because of all the crap that Walmart sells with the China sticker on the bottom. That's not what China is all about, guys. Um, anyway, this, this could be interesting. If, 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 you know, the Chinese population had a better shorter work week i don't know i think it might do them some good and i think we may see some real innovation coming out of china because of this and it might make them even stronger than they already are which is scary <laughs> enough they are freaking they were freaking crazy strong over there yeah all right um this is just a warning guys there's a new uh, bitcoin exchange or no, yeah it's an exchange called uh my neural stay away from it this is a warning do not touch it <laughs> leave it alone the people involved in this have been uh, our proven scumbags who will take your money. So just stand back and that's just, uh, you know, like go ahead and they're probably going to sue me for, for libel or slander or something like that. So I'm just saying, like, it's my opinion that this is something you guys should should leave alone. The fastest growing Bitcoin exchange on the planet. Okay, good. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> All right. All right, let's talk about uh, this new Android, uh, well, this new Android enabling program that Google has created called the Arc Welder. I'll go ahead and let you uh, tell them what this is. So how would you like to be able to run Android apps on a desktop computer at native speeds? Uh, Chrome is doing it, it's coming, and anywhere they have Chrome, basically Chrome, the browser, will turn into Chrome, the OS, if you want it to. And then you'll be able to run Android apps and, and that sort of th sorts of things in your browser um, on your desktop computer. You should be able to move seamlessly between your desktop computer and your tablet and your phone. And so we may actually get the convergence in a way. Now, right now, I think that that in terms of like the convergence and the technologies that are there, I think Apple's kind of ahead of the game there. Because they are, the yeah. messaging interface and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, hey, I've got my laptop and I can respond to text messages from my, you know, on my phone through my computer. And you can, uh, the, one of the reasons Google bought Motorola is so that they could do that. And uh, you can do that on Motorola phones and some other phones well, uh, with you know, some that's, Chrome that's... extensions. I guess that's part of the, one, one of the biggest benefits of having such a controlled environment that Apple has. They control all the products. They control um, everything. You know what I mean? You, you, there's, there's, there, there are no options, but, you know, the, the, the benefit of having no options is it's easy mode for a lot of people. They don't have to mess around and they, can't, they don't have to worry about things. And also, the, the devices are designed to work together in ways that the, the myriad of Android devices just have issues with. So unifying the, and also the fact that, you know, it's, it's one OS, basically, you know, it's, it's just, it's just the Mac OS. That's, that's, it's pretty much, I mean, it's not the same on all platforms, but you know what I mean? It's not like windows and Android and Linux. They're like two completely different ecosystems. So yeah, having a, a unified platform for all the uh, Android apps to work on is a really, really interesting uh, idea. And I, I, you know, I thought they were going to do this a while back, but I was like, maybe they're trying not to cannibalize, you know, the, the success that they've had with one platform and making by making it available on others. But the thing I want to know is, I wonder if this is going to work on like the Ubuntu phone. Since it works with Linux, I wonder if you're going to be able to use these apps on the Ubuntu phone. That would be really interesting. I like the, the Ubuntu phone, and, and I'm, I'm curious about some of the other Linux products coming out. I, if they if you could run Linux on a tablet and have Android apps, that'd be really interesting. And I wonder if the touch will work and all that sort of thing. I, I, that would be something I'd like to play with. Hmm. Um. It, I don't think it's going to happen on the phone because on the desktop it's x86 emulating ARM. Um, oh right, right. But th be ARM this is emulating a kind of ARM. convergence. Yeah, and you know, uh, even before uh, Yosemite on Mac OS, everybody thought Apple was going to do this convergence thing where you could run iPad apps. Like when the new MacBook Air was going to come out, it's like, oh my God, it's going to have an ARM processor, so you can also run iPad apps because it's going to have a touchscreen. That seems like a logical thing for Apple to do. It's like they're going to do a laptop that has a touchscreen or a convertible that has a touchscreen and it has an ARM. It's iPad Pro 
And with iPad Pro, it's like, oh, it's an iPad and a laptop. And then, you know, they've got an answer for the Surface Pro 3. They've got an answer for the Creative Cloud. They've got something with a touch interface. They've got something that's a more advanced version of the iPad, but maybe not as, as whatever as a laptop. It seems like that's a missing piece that's obvious to the peanut gallery in Apple's lineup. They don't have it. They still don't have it. They just came out with a new MacBook. There was no mention of it. I don't know why they don't have a product that does that. And that that's just mind-blowing. And so uh, if Google may beat everybody to the punch having the completely comprehensive mobile app, desktop app, mo- uh, you know, tablet app, the complete ecosystem actually working okay. Technically... Microsoft almost has it. They, they don't have phone with the Microsoft Store, but they've got the, like with the Surface 3 that we'll talk about in a minute and some of the other stuff, they've got sort of the convergence between really portables, portables, tablets, laptops, and desktops, but not phones, now, not, not yet. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the Surface 3. I've got it on the screen here. So the Surface 3 is, uh, you know, you can pre-order it right now. And you know, the, the recent uh, trend is kind of interesting uh, Android is uh, slightly trending down. iOS is slightly trending down. They're still outselling uh, the Surface products and the Microsoft products, but the Surface the Surface is trending up. They're they're actually doing pretty good uh, as far as you know compared to their their their, their history. So I don't know. Do this you, is the you, Surface you... Three, not the Surface Pro Three. And so the difference here is right. that this is an Intel Atom. It's the high end Intel Atom. It's not you know i three i five i seven. So ostensibly it is lower. Uh, lower performance, lower class than the Surface Pro i3 model, but this is available with 64, 128 gigs of flash, two or four gigs of RAM. It's not ARM. It's a Surface 3, but it's not ARM. It's x86, and so ARM, if you needed any more evidence that ARM is dead, ARM for Windows, basically dead, except for some wispy gasps of life around the Raspberry Pi 2 that can maybe run the Windows 10 kernel, but not the GUI, and it's probably just going to be .NET Micro, like we had the Arduino, the version of the Arduino that ran .NET Micro, but it was not actually an Arduino, because an Arduino is 8 bits, and you're not going to be doing .NET in 8 bits, but it was a... uh, 32-bit ARM processor that could do dot, the .NET Micro edition and blah, blah, yeah, blah. I, mean, I don't I even mean, know what I'm saying. But well, I mean, for, for now, yeah, uh, the ARM still wins when it comes to, what are all these guys doing driving around town this time of day? Come on, guys, get out of here. And right, right now, ARM still wins when it comes to power consumption. Uh, you, know, you, you know, just, the, I guess, the, 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 the benchmark of uh, power per performance, it still wins. But, you know, Intel is releasing a uh, new uh, CPU. This is, this is uh, they're kind of silently leasing the the Braswell CPUs. It's Baytrail successor, and, and these things are going to improve upon Baytrail. Baytrail was already extremely uh, efficient, and this is. I mean, they don't compare to any of the ARM stuff. But if you you know if you're looking at like a low power laptop, um, six watt TDP on some of these things, uh, that that's when it's you know just hanging out. But I mean, it, it's about a twenty percent reduction compared to the last generation. And they did move from, I think, 22, uh, the 22 nanometer manufacturing process down to 14. So they're saying that it's also going to run cooler. And uh, it doesn't really get much better as far as the performance goes. But they've just improved the, the battery life, the, you know, the, the little bit cooler and um, uses less power. So uh, they're, they're getting a surprising amount of, um, I mean, they're, they're really um, able to squeeze a lot out of the x86. And I wasn't, I never thought the x86 was going to be this low power, but it looks like it's going to get even better. So that's that's their focus now. A lot of their R&D is going into that instead of, you know, crazy performance. So pretty interesting there. And you guys can go and read the article if you want to know all the specifics. I did, I'm frankly not that excited about it because I'm more of a power user and I'm like, uh, yeah, it's really low power, but... I don't care. I'll plug it in. I'll, I always make sure when I book my flights that there's a plug. You know, it's one of the things. Is, is there a plug on this flight? Can I can I charge my computer? So, <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Anyway, uh, what's next on the list here? Oh, yeah, the Visual Studio. Um, um, video Visual Studio so, thing. I'll, I'll let you get into that. So, With the Chrome situation where it's like, oh, look, you can do stuff with Chrome. You can do Android apps on the desktop now, which I'm really looking forward to because... All of the remote desktop apps on Linux are all crap. They're all insanely terrible crap. And it's like, oh, I support remote FX. No, you don't. Don't lie. You don't. Um, and so you'll be able to run the uh, the Android remote desktop client, which is perhaps not as terrible. So that'll be nice. But Visual Studio is being updated. Microsoft, not to be one-upped, uh, has updated Visual Studio. Now, they announced they were going to support Android, so that's, that's the thing. Now Visual Studio can target Linux uh, for compiling binaries. 
and they can also target Android. And so the feature is there. It's on. It's ready to build an app. I don't know if it's an answer to Android Studio. Kind of doubt it, especially since it's a 1.0. But it's there. At least they're trying. Um, the question is going to be how easy does this make it for companies to take their existing Windows code base and compile it to run on Android? And is that what Microsoft is after? Because there, uh, there was an article about the uh, .NET license, and there's a couple holes in the open source .NET license that uh, may leave the door open to uh, companies being sued for patent infringement. And so Oracle, I think, has done that with Java, and it's not gone well for the, the open source community, and that's, there have been some kerfuffles. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see if that happens with .NET because that was one of the reasons that Mono didn't really take off either. Mono was the open source re-implementation of .NET and now .NET is actually open source and there's a difference there. And so the license still may be questionable, maybe. So it's just, it's a giant mess. All right, let's move on and talk about some, uh, well, this, this actually ties into the whole low power thing we were talking about just a minute ago with uh, Braswell. So some scientists at UCLA have uh, created a very interesting new type of battery that uh, recharges 10,000 times, will hold uh, more power, slightly more power, um, but it, it's going to recharge really fast because they're using s sort of a hybrid supercapacitor. So like a capacitor, right? They do not hold nearly as much power as a battery, but they fill up with power almost instantaneously. You look on a motherboard, they're full of capacitors, and that's just so they can, you know, regulate and uh, keep some energy left over. Uh, it, it, capacitors, that's what they do. They do, they do a lot more than that. But. Even the best capacitors leak current, which means that you charge them up and they self-discharge really quickly. So like with a battery, you charge it up and it will hold its charge if nothing is using it for at least weeks. But practically, I mean, if there's not actually anything connected to the cell, it's months or years but, you know, typical lithium ion uh, stuff, you know, is in sleep mode. And so it's still using power in sleep mode. And so really, you might get, uh, you know, some on a really poorly engineered devices only a couple of weeks uh, because they're using a lot of current in standby. And so with, the, with capacitors and supercapacitors, they leak current, meaning that you charge them up. And then like an hour later, they would be completely stone dead, which is not really super awesome for a battery. So what they've done is they've created these that are they're super thin. They're like they're a hybrid between uh, you know capacitors and batteries, and uh, you guys can read the article to get all the science behind it. But the bottom line is they are about one fifth as thick as a sheet of paper. Then you know you, you can add more of it uh, as far as the thickness goes. But this will this this paves the way for devices that are super thin and uh, you know have charge. You could add uh, you know a battery to you, you could add one of these batteries to something without really impacting the size of the weight of it, um, and it could also quick charge. So there's a lot of people trying to solve the problem right now because I carry, you know, we carry around 15 battery packs whenever we go somewhere because we've got to keep these things charged because we may miss an important email or miss a meeting or something like that. So it's like, oh, we got to keep all these things charged and carry around battery packs. So there are lots of people out there working on solving these, uh, these mysteries. Anyway, let's move on and talk about uh, DirectX 12. Uh, Liquid VR is something that DirectX uh, 10 and 11 really did not do well, and they also did not do um, a multi-threaded stuff very well. But the, the current graphics cards, even last generation graphics cards, are built to take advantage of... Um, well, they're, they're, they're built with these um, asynchronous compute engines. And what those do is they look at the tasks available, and they're able to say, you know what, here's a task and here's a task. We could do this one first. And it basically is a better way to manage tasks and multi uh, and, and do multi-threaded applications. And it's quite a bit faster. That was a super simplification, but, you know, how much time do we actually have to get into that kind of stuff? And how much do you guys really care? The bottom line here is that with DirectX 12, um, the same card can do a lot more. And it's only for certain types of things, you know, like... It's not gonna. It's not gonna work for all games. You know, all games are not gonna get a huge boost, but certain things like they they show an example here, like the asynchronous shaders being turned off and the post processing being turned off. There's your you know 245 fps. Uh, you turn on post processing. Wow, all the way down to 158 fps. But if the asynchronous shaders are on and the post processing is on, well, you're back up to 230 fps because the graphics card is able to better manage. Um, 
you know, what's going on. And it can say, oh, let's do this first. Let's go ahead and render this and get it out of the way because it, it'll only take, a, you know, a hundred milliseconds or something like that. So we did. That's pretty uh, cool. We did the benchmarks on the on uh, the uh, uh, KFA two Galax nine eighty uh, with Star Swarm and DirectX twelve at four K, and the average batch count with DirectX twelve was twice as much uh, as Windows eight point one with DirectX uh, eleven. It was crazy. Yeah, so this this article mentions. Nuts. This article mentions that you know the older AMD cards are going to see um, a, a massive benefit from this, but you know the the GTX 980s and 970s and all that sort of thing, they've got this stuff built in too. So DirectX 11 just did not push these cars to their full potential, and maybe the AMDs will see more of a bump, but we'll have to wait and see. You know when the benchmarks come out, I think they're both going to see quite a quite a decent bump um, in performance with this new API. So I'm really looking forward to it. All right, moving along. Um, how about some perfume that uh, gets better as you sweat more? You know, there's, there's scientists in laboratories working on this as if it were the most important thing that plagues humanity. Sweat smell. I don't know. I, I'm kind of making fun of them for a strange use of their time when they could be out there solving something that, I don't know, does it matter if someone smells bad? Some people can't handle it when they sit down on the bus beside somebody else and they have a nat there's a natural human smell over there. I, it, I'm just like, whatever, it's it's body odor, but <laughs> I'm getting into the philosophy of, of sweat now. <laughs> How did I, I don't even know. I shouldn't even do this anymore. I should quit and go, and go um, eat <laughs> beans and uh, I don't know where I'm going with this. Um, so yeah, but uh, apparently there's, uh, there's a um, new perfume and the way it's going to work is it's going to bond with some of the smelly ingredients in your sweat and help to neutralize that. But it's also going to release more fragrance as it gets wet. So as you sweat, it's going to become stronger and also help to neutralize the, the, the sweat smell. And uh, I'm just, you know, what what different fragrances does this, this come in? That's, that's what I want to know. I want to know what fragrances this is going to come in. Because if, if it comes in like the same fragrances that you get in like the Kmart perfume aisle, well, I'm not really going to want it. Because you're going to smell like the Kmart <laughs> perfume aisle. Like... That's the worst when someone walks by and you're like, damn, stop shopping at Kmart for your perfume. Do they still have Kmarts anywhere? I don't even know. No, I so, don't think yeah. so. I don't know. You're going to start wearing this perfume. <laughs> this anti uh, Just take more showers. I don't know. All right, let's talk about sensory augmentation. This is a very interesting article. They have been able to successfully uh, augment a rat's brain, a, a blind rat. They took a blind rat and they gave it sort of a magnetic GPS. They added a module to the rat's brain that was not there before. And his little mammalian brain was able to uh, decipher what was going on and then use the input from those sensors. So I guess the implications here are that our brains can do a lot more if we just add on modules. So let's say in the future, what if we can get a module to allow us to see infrared light, a module to, to allow that allows us to uh, sense radiation, a module that allows us to uh, sense humidity, and we can know like how humid the air. I mean, we can feel that already through our feeling. But what if we had a specific module for that, and when we hook it up, our brains can learn to use it? These things all could possibly happen. I don't know what what module would you want, Wendell? I don't, I don't know what I would want. <laughs> I would probably want several modules, just because. I mean. Yeah, it's it would it would just be sort of fun and interesting to play with, I guess. Yeah, it's uh, I mean the, it's really interesting technology. The world, that, uh, the, the world as it exists, it, they're, they're, it's full of so many things that we cannot sense or see or or there's just so much going on out there. We, I think it's like four percent we can actually detect ourselves. So there's so much going on out there and, and stuff like this. And just the fact that the the you know their little brains are able to accept the extra module. That, that's really freaking amazing. And, and then they were able to use that to navigate without even, they, they, the, the rat stayed blind, but he was able to navigate using, you know, this module that they gave him. And they didn't, the, 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 brain, the brain sort of did it on its own. The brain sort of started saying, oh, we're getting this, uh, this feedback. Let's figure it out. So the brain was able to, to basically translate what was going on on its own without any sort of reprogramming of the brain, which I think is pretty interesting. <laughs> the direct brain interface is uh, 
sort of the holy grail of, I mean, it's going to have implications, not just for this kind of thing, but also people that need prosthetic limbs, um, people that, that have many different kinds of disabilities, being able to, you know, hook up some technology to a nerve cluster somewhere um, is going to be transformational for healthcare for the world. It's going to be, yeah. it's going to be mind blowing. We're almost there. Soon. All right. You ready to take a look at some video games? Uh, GTA 5 is finally about to come out. Finally. And uh, Rockstar released a 60 FPS PC video. And uh, it looks it looks almost as good as GTA 4 on PC. <laughs> with all the mods. <laughs> yeah, with all the mods. It looks almost as good as the GTA 4 with all the mods. I still think GTA 4 may look better with all the texture mods and the EMB and all that sort of stuff. The Ice Enhancer and all that crap. It may look a little better, but... This one is starting off at about that level, so it's only going to get better from here once the modders get their hands on it. And uh, I don't know, it's look, it looks kind of interesting. Are you going to play GTA V? I don't, I don't think Kane is. I'm kind of interesting. I know Pistol's going to play it. Um, it it looks interesting. I haven't decided yet. I don't. Yeah. I, I don't. I would need to sort of, I guess, put together a machine that I could play it on, or more boot yeah. back to Windows or something. I don't know. I'll have for to me, deal the, with that. for me, this game's weird because I've never really cared about the the content it's a lot of the content to me is very either pop culture some of it's kind of ghetto some of it's kind of uh just mobster and i that content's like never really fascinated my brain or you know it's not i've never been very interested in the content but it's most of the time the gameplay is just so asinine and ridiculous and over the top and fun that you like you, you kind of like get lost in that more than the actual you know what the game's about or whatever. So I've never really been into those stories of GTA five either. They're, they're whatever. I mean, or GTA Grand Theft Auto. The first two games were a ton of fun, but that was just cheesy. They're cheesy little, you know, <clears throat> DOS or windows games. I forget about they DOS or windows. I don't know the cheesy little PC games where you just, you know, fly around and do a bunch of terrible things. And they were silly and off the wall and all that. I, I like those games a lot, but so I don't know if I'm going to play it or not. I might wait until it goes on sale and then pick it up. But, you know, Pistol will be streaming this game very soon. All right, one last thing to add yeah. about games. Uh, good old games. I've They've been my favorite platform for a long time because they're DRM-free. They still have a lot of really good deals. And uh, they, they started off as bringing back all the old school games, but then they expanded to indie games, and now even some mainstream titles are coming over. They're doing this new DRM-free initiative, uh, and it, it works with certain games, and they're trying to make it work with more games. But essentially, here's the way it works. If you guys own Stalker, Mountain Blade, Eodor, uh, possibly a few other games, if you guys own those games on platforms that have, you know, DRM, go get your serial numbers, enter it here, and they'll give you a DRM-free copy of the game. That's a really cool idea, and I'm glad they're doing it. So you you don't have to pay extra. It's just you put in your serial number, and you get a, uh, a new version of the game. So, Or you get I a like DRM-free version of the game. Very cool. I like that this is sort of a special treat for everybody that's hung in there into like minute 57 of, of this. So don't tell anybody. And so the people that closed out early, they get nothing. <laughs> they just added Sea Dogs. Oh my God. They just, I'm home. Oh I just saw this on the sidebar and I clicked on it. Sea Dogs is an old game from 2000. And it came out, I guess, around the time of Daggerfall. And it felt to me like a, like a Bethesda game. But on, but you're a pirate, or you, you don't have to be a pirate. You can be just a whatever, you know, um, a merchant that sails the seas or something. You, but yeah, it's <laughs> it's very fun. I'm gonna God, I'm gonna go play this again. These graphics were <laughs> awful. Oh my God, it was back when like they didn't have enough polygons to make like individual fingers, so everyone's hand is just a, a fist that doesn't move. And whenever you have a sword, there's just a sword inside your fist or whatever. That's one of the graphics were great. Man. Yeah, I guess I need to go replay this game. Anyway, that's the end of the show. Um, let us know what you guys think about, you know, everything in general. And uh, give, give me ideas for uh, things to do in Seattle. I'm, I, we, I ran around a lot, and, and uh, one of the biggest things people said was, do not live in downtown Seattle. And don't worry, guys, we're not going to move into the city. I'm not crazy. You know, I, I don't think I could handle living in the city anyway. I'm more of a, you know, privacy and seclusion and trees type of person. So... We're moving outside of the city, but we're going to be in the area a lot, playing around, 
Uh, maybe we need to, we probably need to get like a Dungeons and Dragons group together or Castles and Crusades or something. We probably need to get some have some game nights. We probably need to go out to some barcades. There's probably a probably a lot that we need to do. But gonna live yeah, across the bay and set up a gigabit laser link to the city. Yeah, there's someone already. You know, I called one of the guys from. Uh, I was talking to the guy from Condo Internet, and he was extremely helpful. But his his response was like, "Well, you know, there's a lot of really fast internet over in Bellevue. If you get a parabolic antenna and put it on your roof, as long as it's within you know within a direct sight line, you should be able to beam a really fast signal back to yourself just for your uploads. And then you could set it up so that Comcast is your regular one for your ping on your games and stuff, so you can still play your games." But if you want to do something like Netflix that doesn't require, you know, a ping, or if you need to send some files back to the home office, you could just make sure you're using that connection over the parabolic antenna that's beaming back into Bellevue. So he was just like, or, or Redmond or something like that. He was like, just find somebody that's got crazy internet or find a service there and I bet they'll do it. So I thought that was pretty funny. And uh, maybe that's the way to go, but I don't think that would be cheap. Or it would be, it would be fun, but maybe not cheap or, or wise. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, uh, go check out the Linux shirt and uh, subscribe to all the channels. And that's the end of the show, so uh, we'll see you guys next week. Maybe. We'll be here.